Welcome everyone. My name is Gretchen Rowe and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to this presentation of Math and the Summer Brain. I think we have some strategies for you all. Several of you raised your hands and said, "Ooh, this is a tough one and we don't quite know what to do about that. So we wanted to address this subject because I think there is a little bit of balance between being able to um, help your kids step back into school and help them step back into school without feeling bad about maybe having taken a break for the summer. We have lots of things to share with you today, and I have the pleasure of being joined by my colleagues, uh, Sue Wachter and Amanda Capps. And we are delighted to spend this next hour with you all. So I'm Amanda Capps, and if you contact Demi Learning, um, I will probably um, be somebody that you could get in touch with via our customer service. I'm a second generation homeschooler. I was homeschooled all the way through and I am currently homeschooling my own eight. I have graduated my first and I have them all the way down to a one-year-old. Um, I've worked for Demi Learning for the last 11 years, um, supporting our customers and students in the math you see, spelling you see, and analytical grammar curriculum. And um, if I've had the pleasure uh, of speaking with you, I hope you found the support you were looking for. And my name is Sue Wachter. I have been uh, helping homeschool parents since 1988. I was just thinking the other day and it's been um, a wonderful uh, journey for me. I did not homeschool my own children. Um, however, uh, as you know, that have had your children in public school or private school, you feel like you're homeschooling sometimes as well. <coughs> so um, anyway, it is my pleasure to help people mainly with placement. That's the main thing I do. I work with placement. I work with a lot of summer brain parents in the summer, um, both the parent and the students having summer brain. Um, and um, the main thing I want to say about it coming in is no judgment either way what you did during the summer. Okay. Um, it's, you know, there's more than one way to address this. And, um, and we hope today through our discussion, you'll kind of have a plan either for next year before you head into summer, or to help you with Currently, you're still dealing with summer brain, um, how, to, how to resolve that. Okay, ladies, so I'm going to launch this uh, conversation today with the thing that we had discussed um, two weeks ago, which is, can, is it true? Can you really take a break from math and still have success? And I know each one of us had an opinion about that. Um, in my opinion, in my household, it was not a successful proposition for us to take the summer off. Um, if we walked away and did nothing academically, um, there was ground I knew we were going to have to replow. And so um, for the 21 years that we homeschooled, I think we only took two summers off. Um, but that having been said, um, our academic experiences in the summer certainly didn't look like our academic experiences during the homeschool year. And so I'd like Amanda and Sue to give you their perspectives, and then we'll kind of uh, launch into this and do some definitions and things like that. So I would concur with that, um, Gretchen. Um, I think really it depends on what type of learners you have. There are kids who are able to stop in the spring and take a bit of a break and um, pick back up and, and, and start moving forward. Um, there are other kids who might have some learning differences or learning challenges where that is just not going to be the correct expectation to have. Um, and so I think if you go into a break with that expectation with those types of learners, you can really set yourself up for some frustration on both of your parts, the student and the teacher. Um, being a second generation homeschooler, I mean, we really didn't take a summer break either. My mom always required that we at least have a good literature you know, reading book that we were involved in um, and that we were doing at least 30 minutes of math a day. So tops, you know, an hour 
out of your summer day really isn't that big of a deal um, to expect of a kiddo, you know, to kind of keep the momentum moving forward. And so I have also adopted that um, principle with mine because I feel like if we stop completely, um, now that doesn't mean we don't ever take breaks. They're just shorter breaks, um, you know, maybe not more than a week or a two at a time, but we might take them more frequently throughout the year and spread those breaks out versus you know, using them as one large chunk of time in the summer. So first of all, I just want to say up front that the ideal is exactly what Gretchen and Amanda said. That is the ideal situation. Uh, just having worked with parents and, and just trying to do placement and figure out what to do for the planning of the next year, the ideal would be to um, have some math going during the summer. However, I have no regrets not having done that. Um, my kids uh, maybe would have fared well better academically if I had. Um, definitely would have not had to, they were going to school. So the school kind of takes care of some of that. They kind of back up the bus and they do review and they refresh with the students. But my kids still would have probably done better with the review if we had done that. So I, I will put out there just from my experience with you, the parents, that is the ideal. I didn't do it. I have no regrets. Our dynamic, we just needed some time off and so we took it. If you could um, balance for us. We had discussed about what are the things that we're seeing in the conversations we're having with parents. I wonder if you could maybe address that a little bit, um, some of the behavioral things that parents are seeing that may be part of what we term the summer brain syndrome? Uh, well, probably the big one, my biggest concern would be if they're dealing with coming out of school, not having their facts memorized. And because of our um, intervention product that we have, our AIM products, it's only a 15 minute a day um, proposition. So that would be, it would not only help the students be not lose anything, but they would actually gain so much that you actually could find that when you come back in in the fall, that they're actually doing better than they were on other subjects as well, because the fact mastery affects so many other things. So if you had a student that was just had been struggling or you had to drill, drill, drill every day to get them to be functional in their work, that would be well worth um, the time to just get that taken care of. And even if you did it four days a week, 15 minutes a day would be still give them an advantage coming in in the fall. That would be my number one one. Um, if there, I would also look for uh, because you are homeschooling, you're more aware of exactly where the fuzzy areas are. I would identify those fuzzy areas uh, coming out of the year and do, um, we have documents that we share with customers on how to just do one problem a day in that fuzzy area. Don't, don't make them do a whole worksheet and torture them with that, but just one a day consistently four to five times a, a week would be a great benefit because then they would really get it locked in um, some areas. So maybe pick some fuzzy areas, don't have them do um, everything, but just kind of observe at the end of the year, oh, this is an area where, you know, you have to, if they haven't done it in a couple of weeks, you have to remind them that type of thing. Just maybe be, my thinking is be more aware of as you come out of the school year, what those areas are. Can maybe both of you talk a little bit about what you look for in a conversation with a parent um, in trying to assess what might be a gap? Amanda, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, so with a gap, that is more of a, that's more of an area where we need to make sure that it isn't just, hey, I forgot this. And then the minute they are prompted, they're like, oh, oh yeah. And they immediately pick it back up and they can, and they can run with it. Um, a gap is more of a deer in the headlights. I don't remember this. Even as you're sitting here explaining it to me, I'm struggling to grasp what you're saying and, um, and kind of just that 
um, almost an anxiety situation. Like they, they look like they should know, like they, 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 they kind of have that feel like that look. Cause obviously, you know, they're reading off of you and you're going, okay, wait a minute, we've, we've done this. Um, and so gaps can happen and really happen in two situations. One, a, a child literally just forgets something that they have been exposed to because it wasn't mastered the first time they were exposed to it. And two, you can be jumping around to different curriculums and because of the difference in curriculums and their sequences, gaps can just naturally occur. That can just happen. Um, so those are kind of the two main scenarios um, that we see where gaps occur. And then um, a big part of our job is helping a parent identify where the gaps really are and then filling those gaps in successfully with mastery and then moving forward. Okay. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about um, what a parent should be looking for in trying to determine just, oh, I don't remember how to do this versus, oh, I am just at a loss. Um, so I know that you um, use uh, some assessment tools to do that. So, right. can you talk a little so bit? for me, there's a couple things that I'm, first of all, the parent and I try to figure out what we can figure out to get some clues because one of the things that I don't like to do and I'm glad Amanda mentioned uh, stress if your student is under stress and emotional through math that's a big trigger like that, that is a there's something going on there and that usually doesn't have to do with what you're doing now it's there is a gap so finding that gap it's important to as you're doing the assessments to get that emotion out of it. Because if the panic sets in, you don't know what they know because the brain is blocking off the information. So we have developed as a team, we've developed some assessments that are designed to be as stress free as possible. They don't look like a test. They look like they're just a, a worksheet, but they are. there's high intent. There's instructions for the parent to observe while they're doing the assessment so we so the parent can gather more information so that we can get clarity and they're not long drawn out tests so we try to work within a, a small space of time where they get we get the best of their best and then we start out the assessment and it might it might be an assessment that takes three days and you're just doing these short sessions and the first session is a little easier and so if, like amanda talked about like they just couldn't remember. You can do some support and reminding them. And the, then to see at, at, by the third day if they're still able to do it or if they're still needing a lot of help. So that it's more than just handing them a sheet and seeing what's right or wrong. We also, as a team, you can send those results to us. We make sure they sh uh, show their work because uh, especially as they get older, they don't like to show their work, but it's important that they show their work. And then we evaluate. I'm not always just looking, is the answer right or not? It's like, what did they do to get to the answer? Did they just make a clerical error? I'm not going to worry about that. I, I want to look at as much as I can to get the clues as to where the gap is so that I also, as we go to fill gaps, we don't irritate the child more by trying to fill a gap that isn't really a gap. So it takes time. I mean, sometimes it's a couple phone calls and 10 emails, but I'm a big proponent of taking the time to get it right. Um, this is important. We want the student to be as engaged as possible and we don't want to over test them. So a lot of it is the observation, using tests that don't look like tests, all those things are used so we can get good information. And I think Stephen has made a valuable point here in the chat, um, which if you're watching this as a recorded version, you won't be able to see, but um, what he says is sometimes he will come upon a difficult problem. He can tell when it's really bothering him. He'll take a break for a day or even two. And then when he comes back to it, he has a fresh set of eyes. And sometimes really that is the difference between summer brain and a lack of understanding. If there is anxiety about a particular process, if a student can walk away and dissipate the anxiety and then come back and say, oh, yes, I remember how to do this, then you really are dealing with a summer brain situation. And that's a different way to address that. Now, are we saying um, to walk away every time math gets um, 
an uh, anxiety provoking. Um, I would have never sat down at the table if um, I had walked away every time math made me anxious. Um, so there's a balance there, but being able to recognize that kids can't learn at their best optimum when they are stressed out makes a tremendous amount of difference. Amanda, can you talk a little bit, one of the questions that one of uh, the parents ask us is, how can you differentiate between a skill that needs reassessment and a skill that just is that, as Stephen described, walk away from it, let your brain marinate on it, and then come back to it? Is there a way we can give parents a way to understand that better? Absolutely. I mean, I feel like it's pretty... Um, easy to diagnose in this, in this situation. There's a difference between, uh, you know, uh, I, I forgot or, or, you know, you see the light bulb kind of start coming back on when you're doing a quick review or rundown. And this is a perfect opportunity as a parent to model for the student. I mean, if they're not quickly jumping in there and are like, yeah. Oh, right. I remember this. And then they're kind of taking over. Um, this is a good opportunity to model that, build it, say it, write it and take them back through the process because sometimes they just get lost in the process or they're missing a piece of the process. They understand the concept overall. They're just missing a piece in the process versus I don't even remember or know how to set this up. I am not sure what I'm being asked to do. I mean, you're going to, you're going to, definitely notice um, a kiddo that is starting to kind of get into that anxiety place. They aren't able to articulate or answer the questions that maybe you're asking them or the prompts that you're giving them. Um, that would be my indication that, okay, we've really forgotten something here. We've really got a gap. We really need to maybe take a step back and review. And I need to figure out, okay, what book was this taught in? What video did we, did we watch? Um, and we need to maybe print some extra practice sheets and, and address this as if we just really didn't master the concept the first time around. Great. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more in depth about um, that teach back element, particularly when we're reviewing something that we might not have a tight handle on, how valuable that can be in a parent knowing where the, the gap might be. Right. And I think the teach back is the secret sauce of success, to be honest. And it really is a skill to help your par your student develop that ability and understand that having a conversation with another person about what you're trying to learn is makes an incredible difference. So often we think, oh, if we're really smart, we can just do everything without any interaction with other people. It's just powerful. It is so powerful. And sometimes um, that's overlooked. You know, you get caught up in your busyness and you um, just say, okay, let's just watch the video. Okay, okay, can you do the worksheet and move on? But the teach back is what makes it stick because the reality is when you have to prepare to teach, and I say this to parents who are trained teachers all the time and they go, you are absolutely right. When you have to prepare your lesson, you, we have to prepare to teach someone else. You store the information correctly. Otherwise, they might just be storing it in short-term memory, just enough to get the work done and get mom happy I mean so there's a difference and so rather than what I usually recommend is don't let them go past the if you're in math you see the practice pages until they can teach it back and they have not seen the video in the last 24 hours and that way you have a better chance of not ending up with a gap in the end because a lot of kids are, are able to use short-term memory to get that lesson done and then you don't have anything when you leave. And then when you circle back to it later, it's gone. So it's, it's something that, and it also makes them responsible for their learning as well, because then they're required to figure out how they're going to teach it back. They're, they're required to say, you know, let you know they're ready to teach it back or not. And it's okay if the next day they can't teach it back. Say, that's awesome. And there's three worksheets here. Obviously, it takes a couple days sometimes. So go ahead, go ahead and rewatch the video, see if you can prepare your lesson. And you can even, um, you know, 
watch the video with them and help them with their lesson plan or depending on the student they might just like being independent and and um and put their own lesson plan together to to teach you tomorrow but don't overlook that i just can't stress enough the high value of that and then if you have your your um student that wants to do all this mental math trust me if they want to really do well and even better with mental math do the teach back it's going to escalate that incredibly along with use because they're going to use the manipulatives in the teach back and that's going to going to give them more information to store in their brain to be able to do things in their head can you also talk about and you probably said this and i was um trying to capture uh, multiple pieces of information here but um that the essentialness of the teach back with the manipulatives why is that different than just let me explain this to you because that's where you're going to get the concrete understanding is that where you were going through for mm -hmm. that's where it's going to be something concrete and when you've actually handled and manipulated something <coughs> you're you're going to remember it better than if you just saw something happen or um it's it's better than observational when you can actually get in and handle um, what's going on and, and to be able to see what's going on by movement, touch, voice, hearing, all, using all the modalities um, <clears throat> to get that locked in really good in the long-term memory. Okay. Um, all right. So what if I missed ladies in our preparation for this meeting? Um, uh, from our notes before we turn our attention back to questions that people have asked? Well, one of the things I want people to understand is don't think of that this is a sales pitch because trust me, if I can help you fill a gap without selling you something, I will. Um, there's only going to be a sale involved if it's needed, especially if it's a gap. Um, so just be assured that as we take you through this process of when you find a gap, which that's usually what's happening with summer brain, it really is a good way to identify where the gaps are, um, that we will work with you to find a plan that is cost effective and time effective as well. So I just want to make sure you know that. And then also um, somehow in there, um, if you aren't already, if a lot of times parents will say, well, we're working two hours on math now. And it's like, that's too long because trust me, your child checked out at about 15 minutes, depending on their age, 15 or 20 minutes, they, they have checked out. So all that work is, is actually not also typically very profitable. So be aware, we usually say if they're trying to learn something new, not if there's something they already know, if they're trying to understand something new, you figure their age plus two. So that was the main thing um, that I wanted to make sure that we talked about attention span and make sure that this is not a sales pitch here. We are genuine, trust me, we are here to help you figure out those gaps and find the most cost-effective, time-effective way to do that. And I would just say from a customer support standpoint, don't wait until you are frustrated, overwhelmed, and feeling the anxiety yourself to reach out to us. Um, most of us have either taught, tutored, or supported customers and parents through Matthew C um, for many years. And we have a wealth of tips, resources, and, and, and support that we can offer you your, as a parent and a student um, or, or, at, or, or a student or a parent. Um, and we are more than willing and available and happy to do that. Um, we're available Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the phones in live chat. You can email us um, during the off hours and you know we will follow up and we will get you supported. Amanda, if can you help our parents understand that uh, the difference between just going back to what they've done before if they find a gap? So if they find a child with a multiplication gap, why can't drill and kill fill that gap for us effectively? So uh, drill. I mean, does anyone like to drill? I mean, is that <laughs> is that even a thing? Does that does anyone enjoy that? Um, and yet, 
I would say that is probably one of the most utilized resources we have on our website is our is our drill application. I mean, I, I talk with parents on the daily who require daily drill from their students. Um, and not that that's a bad thing. I mean, it's always a good idea to practice something, but anytime we can get away from drill and, and apply it to real life, apply it to word problems, get it off the page. Um, you know, I know with fractions, especially my kids always enjoyed it if we took it into the kitchen and we did cooking and I would sometimes really, you know, make it challenging for them by going, okay, you have to double the recipe, but you're only going to get allowed to use, you know, this measuring cup, <laughs> figure it out. Um, and sometimes that ended in disaster and, 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 and something that was inedible, but a lot of times it, it ended up being a really awesome opportunity for some fun and some, you know, putting our heads together and how can we make this work and, and looking at equivalent fractions and looking at adding uh, uh, fractions or um, subtracting fractions. And so, you know, I think sometimes as parents, we get very focused on drills, workbooks, you know, crossing all of our uh, T's, dotting all of our I's, and we have to do every problem and we have to do, you know, all the things. Um, and yet we can really bring math into everyday life and apply it to situations all the time um, if we are just aware and looking for those opportunities. Um, and I love to be able to especially with my kiddos that maybe have some learning challenges and really struggle in the traditional textbook school drill environment. Um, when I can, I can have them engage in something mathematical and then point it out to them like, hey, you just did X, Y, Z, um, and we didn't even get out a pencil or a pen, and we didn't look at a math problem, we didn't look at, you know, anything school related, <laughs> or that they would identify as school related. And yet there, there we are, we're using our math and we're using, and, and that's really the entire goal of math you see is being able to take it off the page, use it in real life, engage with it and understand how it works. Absolutely. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit, we had a great deal of conversation about, um, recognizing when an, uh, algebra one student is struggling. And um, the three of us know that that struggle didn't begin in Algebra 1. Can you talk a little bit about what foundational skill sets an, a parent of an older child would need to make sure are in place so that student would not have struggle as they step into you're, Algebra You're talking one. about deciding whether they're ready or as they go into Algebra 1. Uh, as so, they go into Algebra 1, like what are those foundational things like fractional? Um, right. A passive so, it yeah. is very fascinating. Um, I do a lot of algebra one readiness placement and pre-algebra. Both of them um, kind of had the same response. But it's almost always a student that has been kind of struggling going into algebra one because you want to make sure that that foundation is there. It's going to be worth your time and stress to before you even open that Algebra One book to whether you're with us or not, with Matthew C or not, is to find out what their basic skill set is and fill in those gaps. The number one skill set that's missing is fractions. That one comes up pretty consistently. They might even have more of their pre-algebra, they might have their decimals, but the fractions is the number one. And the thing is with Algebra, we're not, cutting up pizzas anymore when we use fractions in algebra one you really need to understand the hows and the whys and i mention this and parents consistently agree with me that the problem is with the fractions is the formula is so simple it's such a simple formula so the student and the parent get where the student says oh remind me how to do this and you give them the quick reminder and they get the worksheet done and all they've learned is if you want to know how to do a fraction, ask mom or dad. And they don't integrate it for themselves because they're kids. They're not going to say, oh, I better really understand these fractions. They're not going to do that. And so it's very common before going into Algebra 1 that one of the gaps that we have to fill is the fractions. And I will tell you the way we teach fractions is I would feel it safe to say the best 
curriculum out there for learning fractions. Because we ha help that student really understand what's going on with fractions so that when they do get to Algebra 1 and fractions are one of the many options to solving this equation, that they, those students know when to pull those fractions in and use them. That's terrific. I think and it was one assessments for that. We, I mean, and and we're we're glad to share any of that with you. If especially if you already started algebra one and you're starting to have some struggle. Amanda, I was going to say I was one of those kids that I did fairly well in math because I was a good memorizer until fractions. Fractions is where you can't really just memorize anymore, and you have to really know what's happening and and how those things are breaking down um, in order to be successful. And so I was incredibly thankful that about that time is when our family found Matthew C and transitioned us into it. And while I did go back and address some gaps because we did a lot of curriculum hopping um, in my early uh, education, um, that really, I, I, don't, I don't think I would have been a successful student in high school had we not done that. And that is one of the things that I love about the beginning of our Algebra One program, we have our readiness, Algebra One readiness assessment. That is absolutely fantastic as a tool to help diagnose, is this child truly ready for Algebra One? And where are the gaps if they are not? Because it, it does break it down by section. And so when, it, when a student takes that exam and then talks with somebody in customer service or come someone in customer support um, and placement, we can very efficiently help you figure out where those gaps are and address those and come up with a plan and move forward successfully from there. Um, with that, that was, thank you for that uh, great explanation and that segue into what I wanted to talk about next, which is, suppose I'm a parent who finds a gap, does it mean a whole year to fill that gap? And can you guys talk about what happens if you fill one gap? What happens to the things that fall behind it? So, well, we see this over and over again, and that, that's when they're my favorite email to get from a parent. When uh, we took the time, we we took the time to find the gap, and we filled the gap, and then the the parent and the student are celebrating. It's like, wow, we couldn't even do this before. And now because we filled this gap, it dominoed into other concepts and we're more functional. And so that's why people, you're always, I mean, it's, it's normal to feel like, oh, if we pause and do this, are we going to get behind? I've seen over and over and over again, when we fill those gaps, the student actually excels beyond what they would have had they not filled that gap. And also, then they're a little more interested in math when it's successful. So part of the problem is too, the student shows up for their math lesson and they go, oh boy, here we go again. This isn't gonna go well. And they've already kind of given up going in. Whereas if we fill those gaps and this, you know, so I've had moms say, my son was struggling and he said to me this morning, I love math. and the reason kids love math is because they're successful. Think of that as an adult. If you had to go do something every day and every day you floundered and flopped around and it was miserable, would we show up? I mean, we wouldn't. We probably wouldn't show up physically. They don't, they show have to show up physically, but they can certainly not show up mentally. And it can be, I just can't stress how much a difference it can make uh, to fill those gaps. Um, either whether you take the summer off or not, recognize those gaps and take some time. It might take a couple months. And I, I like to like say, let's allow a couple months so that we aren't saying, oh, we have this gap to fill and oh, we're getting behind and we should be here someplace else. And, you know, we're running out of time. Um, it, it just makes such a difference just to relax, um, maybe get the anxiety out of math. There's a lot that we can do during that gap filling time beyond just math. We can help with the emotional, all of that. Um, and also sometimes we're glad to take you through the long-term plan so that you can say, okay, let's say it takes us till Christmas to get this gap. That means we'll be likely be here um, at, at the first of the year. And let's say then next year we're here. Now we're, then we're having success. 
And then we can say, oh, looks like when they graduate, they're going to be in pre-calculus. So I, it, maybe they're not behind. Maybe we're just filling in gaps and they're right on track. Um, but we help you with all that and with the information we've learned from other, other customers and just through the years of having this conversation. This isn't something new. We've been having this conversation for years. It's happening all the time. Amanda, knowing that you've had a variety of different ages of learners in your household, can you talk a little bit about the differences in children as far as when they can maybe look at an independent math experience as opposed to a parent-centered um, math collaboration? So. Absolutely. And, and that is a question that we get a lot. Um, and I will say, you know, there are parents who, who have the expectation um, that, you know, as a child is growing and maturing, that they would be able to take more of the leadership and responsibility for their own education. And that is valid. And that is absolutely um you know, reasonable, depending on the kid, depending on the maturity level, depending on the age, um, and depending on what they're working with. I mean, I have kids um, that are 10 and 12 that have some learning challenges. And so while maybe for my first two who were naturally self-motivated and naturally driven, I allowed them to be more independent much earlier, um, I'm still going to need to sit there and maybe devote that 20 to 30 minutes with them um, to keep them focused and to keep them on track just because of their own, you know, personal struggles and, and areas where they, where they are so in you know, clear, manifesting deficits. You're talking about your needing to be available for your 10 and 12 year olds because of their learning challenges. Absolutely. I mean, they're just they're just naturally going to get distracted and not be able to give me the maximum focus if I allow them to be at their own devices. And, 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 and it is, and it's, it's even just as simple as time management. I mean, we know as adults, you know, it's like, if I need to leave the house by a certain time in order to get somewhere on time, I'm going to manage the time I have until that time I need to be ready to walk out the door differently than a child or an adult who has no time awareness and is chronically late. And, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a lot more about setting them up for success and helping them be equipped with the right skills and, and maximizing time. Um, the other thing that I would love to say here too, is you're not, you're not ever behind as a homeschooler. We can be so much more effective with the time that we're spending with our students um, that you really don't ever have to worry about being behind. And I hear a lot of times in a parent's voice when I'm talking with them and they realize that there are gaps to address that they're the ones with the anxiety. It's like <gasps> somehow they take it personally and they feel like they're failing at homeschooling or they're failing their child. And you're not, you're not because you're calling us and you're addressing gaps and you're aware that something needs to change and you're looking for the tools and the information to help yourself and to help your student do that. So you're not behind, you're not failing. Um, we can be our own worst critics and I can just tell you time and time again that we see that process in customer service and, and like what Sue is talking about where we we give you some tools, we give you some information, and then suddenly you're right back on track, you're making up ground. And then yes, you're, you're right. I mean, we're seeing the dividends and the fruit of that just multiply exponentially as you continue those processes and as you continue network support, reaching out, I cannot stress to you the importance of those things in your journey. Great, Sue? I just, sounds so good. I don't know what even to add. Or do you have an, <laughs> a thought, a hint that what yeah, I might want to be talking about? Um, I would like you to, to revisit the thing that you often say to parents about tears and what do you do oh, when tears in the household? So we have a rule around here with our customers. And the rule is if anyone is crying at the math table, you need to call. And, and I'm serious. We, we get a parent you just need to be talked off the cliff. We'll do it. I mean, we, we're passionate about helping you no matter what. If you're using our products, we want to help you be successful. And sometimes we need to just talk to another adult and find out that we're okay. 
or have someone help us give us some tips or um, get you back believing in yourself again. And uh, we do that every day. I know Amanda and Gretchen do, um, and we're here for you. Um, I don't think people realize that, that we're not just gonna sell you stuff. Like I said earlier, we're, we're here for you. We're here to get in the trenches with you and figure out how to be successful with your homeschooling. So in that process then, when there are tears at the beginning of math time, um, there is a tremendous amount of virtue for you as the parent to figure out why there are tears. I know there were plenty of tears when we began math at my household and they were coming from me because I didn't feel like I was well equipped to understand. One of the things that makes math you see so successful is it is designed to be a one-on-one -on -one tutorial experience for you to work with your student. And um, Amanda, I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about how you support parents, particularly those parents who feel like they're inadequate to the task. Um, what can they do as they go through their Matthew C experiences to make sure their kids are getting the best out of it and to alleviate their own anxiety? What would be the best way for a parent to address their understanding of the Matthew C lessons? I think first of all, and sometimes the most um, misrepresented information about Matthew C is our instruction materials are for the parent. <laughs> They're not necessarily for the student. And while we do have a lot of families where the child and the instructor watch the video together, and there is absolutely 100% nothing wrong with that, um, and, and it is completely fine, there is some value as a parent in maybe watching that prior to viewing it with a student, um, availing yourself of the tools. I, I, my favorite customer support experience is when I get a call like I did last week where a mom is learning a, a concept alongside their child in Gamma. And so she called in for support and she's like, I did not learn it this way. I do not understand how to do multiple digit multiplication with the blocks. Can you walk me through it? And she was going to actually copy the first three practice lessons of her student workbook so she could do the problems herself and really familiarize herself with the process so that she felt comfortable and confident in teaching that to her student. And I just want to say as a customer support person, hats off, because that is what it's all about. It's about equipping you with understanding and, and tools and showing you how to use the manipulatives and be comfortable with teaching those concepts so that when you are teaching, when they do have those questions, you feel confident and comfortable in handling it and you're able to model it and you're able to walk them through the steps. And then you both have those light bulb moments and that understanding and that aha moment. And that is priceless. And that's why we really homeschool at all. Um, and that is when it's really exciting to come alongside of a parent and, and go, yes, they are going to be successful. They understand what they're doing. They're using the tools at their um, disposal and they are, they're going to be successful. They just are. Sue, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the value of the problems we get wrong versus the value of the problems we get right. I'll be honest. This is something I'm still learning as an adult to embrace getting problems wrong. And um, I would really um, take a look at, make a decision on how you're going to handle that. So I know some people will just make them redo everything until they get it right. Um, but consider a couple other things like, how about um, pick, looking at it? Like if you just see it's a clerical error and you know it was just a matter of they added something wrong, I wouldn't have them redo that. Um, but you might have them pick a couple of them and say, okay, so what I'd like you to do is just go in and see um, if you can figure out what went wrong on this one. Don't make them do an all of it. Especially if you see a consistent thing happening where they're consistently doing something wrong, pick a couple problems that they get that wrong again for the same reason and have them go in and discover for themselves uh, why they got the answer incorrect. 
And it's important to realize that making mistakes is how we learn. It's our best learning tool. And, and the key to letting it be a learning tool is to not be beating ourselves up every time we get one wrong and thinking that we're just not smart or we, we just don't know what we're doing or, um, and, and maybe even make a, um, you know, if they maybe start keeping track, keep a journal of what, go in and find out what they did wrong, either you or them or both of you, and keep a journal of what is consistently happening. Like if they consistently see that the reason they're getting the problem wrong is X, Y, or Z, then you can address that. That could be a gap. It just could be a gap. Or it could be random and you go, I don't know, um, maybe you're giving them too much work to do. Maybe you're having them do two worksheets and they just check out and it's they're overloading. Um, doing more isn't always the best. Um, just you, they're trying to learn. They're not needing to do a marathon every time. So just kind of evaluate why they're getting things wrong. Um, I don't recommend grading the practice pages if you're in Matthew C. Um, because that's the, where the learning's happening. So we don't want them worrying about grades or anything. That's where the learning's happening. They're experimenting with what they're learning and it gives you and the student a chance to see where they still need to be strengthened. So um, just think about how you're grading. Um, whereas like if you're just doing 80% or an A or a B or a C, that doesn't always tell the student anything about what they need to do to be more successful. So um, that's a whole nother topic that, you know, the purpose of grading and, and how you do grading. But um, Amanda- And I think it's to... really important to jump in at this point too and, and stress that each child is different. And in the curriculum, we make allowances for the kiddo that they're naturally mathematic. They pick up concepts quickly. They may just build, say, and write at one time. They're doing a lesson practice and they're getting, you know, 95% or better on that page. Do not make that child do every problem and every page in the lesson. We often see a student that they do lesson practice A, they do systematic review D, they do the teach back they do the test and they're ready to move on to a new concept. And if you literally had them sit and do every single worksheet and every single problem, they're going to lose interest. They're going to be bored out of their minds and they're not going to stay challenged. There are other children who have significant learning challenges. They may have that working memory issue and they really need the repetition and the process and they need to do all the lesson practice pages they need to do all the systematic review pages they need to teach back and they need to do, to do the test but please as a parent be aware and know your child well enough that you can make that determination for them and you can customize and curtail it to what they need um, i talk with so many parents sometimes where you know i can tell that's like the mom needs every problem to be done and every page and the, and the kids just losing the momentum because they're, they're only struggling because they're bored and it's okay to not do all the work. It's okay not to do every problem. Um, but sometimes we really have to give parents permission for that um, or even broach that topic with them and say, Hey, have you thought about doing this and seeing how it works for your student? And I think here is the value of that teach back when we miss the, uh, the power of that teach back component. We don't know how many problems they need to do to be successful. Um, so we just keep having them do problems instead of giving them the latitude to teach back to us. I do want to bring up one thing. A couple of parents have asked questions um, when they uh, registered for the webinar about um, what do you do to uh, stay on task? And I think um, there are fewer and fewer of us who are defined as neurotypical learners. Um, we have learned, particularly in the pandemic, that there's a very uh, broad scope of what defines learning and learning success. And I will tell you, um, I didn't, didn't learn until I was in my 50s that um, uh, despite being an only child, a German who does it because she should um, I learned that I have attention deficit disorder. And one of the most powerful things that I have learned in the last year of studying, what does that mean? How do you approach 
um, uh, challenges with kids who have attention deficit disorder? How do you help them surmount it? Um, for years and years, uh, the conventional wisdom with ADD was you have to do the hard things first. So you do those things first and you get them out of the way and then your student can move on to the things that they like to do. Um, there's some pretty cutting edge research in the field of education and neurodevelopmental psychology that says that kids with attention deficit are more likely to complete a task if they are engaged and allowed to enter in. So if you are the parent like me who believed that always you did the hard stuff first, so you got it out of the way, um, let me encourage you to think a little bit differently about the possibility of having your student look at what is required of them in a day and ask them how they think they would engage best um, with materials. Um, sometimes giving them the autonomy to choose what comes next helps them become more engaged in the process. And I think as parents, we um, sometimes get in mind that we want an end game that is successful, particularly because this is a very difficult job for which you may not see fruit um, as you, of the investment of your time and efforts and love and blood and sweat and tears for years. And because of that, um, we sometimes sacrifice um, uh, our success on the altar of we need to do more. And more is, as Sue said earlier, sometimes the enemy of better. Um, so if you can think about how to help your children address their learning gaps, how to help them feel more successful, I'd rather you have a 15 minute successful math experience um, that they walk away from and they still have a mental thumbs up for you than have you spend an hour or 90 minutes and have it be an exercise in perseverance, not in academic excellence. And I think that makes a tremendous amount of difference. Um, we're coming to the bottom of the hour, ladies. So what are your closing suggestions for um, folks who are uh, going to be watching this uh, video today? I, I think one of the things that it's always a little late in August, but um, call us in May when you're wrapping things up um, call us in May and let's take a look at gaps then, because that's where the gaps are going to be clearly gaps and not just summer brain. Um, and then, then make a decision there what you're going to do during the summer, if you're going to do something or be prepared that if you're noticing a gap in May, chances are it's going to be there in September and put a plan together for it. And we're glad to work with you on that and get a good placement. It's really hard coming in first time. Those of you that have come in first time and, and took a break during the summer, um, it's hard to get a good assessment, um, but we usually end up doing it by using some of the tools that we have for you know stress-free assessing and that type of thing can make a big difference. And a, you know, a three-day assessment short term, you know, with short um, pages, we have ways to get through that. But if you're here now, that means um, next May, let's talk, let's, let's talk then and, and put together a plan, um, whether you're, again, whether you're doing summer work or not, uh, and be prepared for fall. And um, so I hope if nothing else you got out of this, call us, we're here for you. Amanda. I would just say um, there is no one that knows your child and advocates better for your child than you. Um, so you're, you've taken a huge step just in choosing to homeschool and be you know, involved and engaged in your child's educational experience. And that is huge. I mean, that's 90% of the battle right there. But um, my encouragement would be don't neglect the fact that you need support. You need to network with other parents. Um, nothing happens in a vacuum. If you are isolated and you feel isolated, then you're going to struggle and you're going to take those struggles into your classroom and, and into your interactions with your kids. So make sure that you're, you know, reading authors that espouse great homeschooling ideas and tips and get in a group, find a Facebook group. If you don't have one locally that you can plug in and you guys can, you know, get in the weeds a little and vent a little and, you know, and get ideas um, from other parents because, you know, 
that is so valuable in your journey is not comparing yourself to others. Like don't get, don't get on that wagon. Um, you know, comparison is the thief of joy, but, but there can be a lot of joy in collaboration and networking and what works for you and, and what kind of learning style is your kiddo and what, what resources have really, you know, ignited their passion for learning because ultimately the goal is lifelong learners. We don't want lifelong work worker, work, work, work bookers. <laughs> we want lifelong learners. We want kids that are equipped with the tools and the strategies to go into the world and learn and absorb and question and shake things up. And that's why we do this. And that's why we love coming every day to our jobs is to support you all in that process and in that journey and equipping you with the tools you need to, to launch these lifelong learners. I think Amanda has said something very valuable there. A support system is a vital component to being a successful homeschool family. And if you have joined us for this video and you still have questions, we would encourage you to reach out to us and please know that um, if we can be part of that support system for you, we definitely want to do that. We thank you all for joining us today and we look forward to the next time that we're together. And uh, in the interim, if you know of someone who would appreciate the information that we're sharing, please feel free to share it. You don't have to be a Demi Learning family to join us for these roundtables. We want to make this information valuable to anybody who finds themselves on the journey of homeschool. We want it to be a joyful one. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining me today, everyone. And we wish you a joyful day. Take care.